any questions so far about the stream ribbons and stream tubes and the seating dimensionality? Just as a little review, we started out Flowvis by introducing the different subcategories, direct, geometric, texture-based, and feature-based. And now we're, we're talking all about the geometric flow visualization techniques. We, this is where we spend the most time, is talking about the geometric flow base. So those are the category where we compute a discrete object whose properties reflect the characteristics of the flow. And that includes streamlines, path lines, streak lines, <clears throat> uh, stream ribbons, stream surfaces, and stream tubes. So all those things that we mentioned so far. The other category we talked about were, was direct flow visualization, and that was the, using glyphs and uh, color mapping, briefly. And after we look at the geometric flow base, the next topic we'll look a little bit at is texture-based flow visualization. But right now we're in the middle of this geometric flow visualization theme on the, on the map of DataViz, uh, let's say the DataViz landscape. So we're going to talk about stream surface construction. This is a stream surface, by the way. And those are seeding curves. So we generally seed stream lines, surfaces with a, a, a 1D curve, a straight edge, as opposed to a streamline, which is a 0D point. So we're raising the dimensionality of, of everything. So we're raising the dimensionality of the seeding object by one and the resulting surface. And the question is, how do we construct those? How do we actually make those or generate those? And this is a difficult topic, actually. This is a non-trivial algorithm, I would say. But it's good to be here because this could even be on the test, maybe. <laughs> So before we jump into the details, though, it's good to just remind ourselves why. Why is this an interesting topic, or why would we even want to construct stream surfaces in the first place? So it's good to compare stream surfaces with stream lines. So why, why are stream lines so often used to depict flow? Well, implementation is certainly an advantage in the case of streamlines. Streamlines are most commonly used geometric flow based technique. They're easy to implement, despite what it looked like in the last lecture, or two lectures ago, rather. They're intuitive, so their interpretation is not difficult. So these are some 3D streamlines. And they are very applicable. They are applicable to all vector fields, both in 2D on surfaces and in 3D. But they do have some disadvantages. So if we have too many streamlines, especially in 3D, it can become very complex and difficult to understand. If we don't add shading to the streamlines, they're difficult to perceive because there's no well-defined normal vector. Here, I've, I've added like a, an, a radius to the streamlines, so they, they look like tubes, but they're normalized tubes. And that way, we can add shading. But we saw a slide earlier today with just 3D streamlines with no shading. And then there is seeding. We always have to figure out a seeding strategy for the streamlines. This, I would say this is a solved problem in the cases of 2D and surfaces, but still an unsolved problem in 3D. 
but it's it's still an added complexity that we have to be concerned with generally. So what about stream surfaces? Stream surfaces address some of the limitations of streamlines. So a stream surface, again, is a surface that's everywhere tangent to the flow. By the way, that is orthogonal to an isosurface in flow. Not that that's, that's not really a test question or anything, but if you're wondering about the relationship between isosurfaces and stream surfaces, how do we, we can, we can, this is one definition of a stream surface. Here's another one. The union of all streamlines seated at all points of a curve, the seating curve. That's another way to define a stream surface. And you could say it's the next higher dimensional equivalent to a streamline. These are stream surfaces, by the way. And this one has perforations, the, the arrows in the, in, the, in the surface. And we can extend this idea to unsteady flow through path surfaces and streak surfaces. So the idea, the general idea can be extended to unsteady flow, but not without some changes to the implementation. So something about the implementation will have to change which we will actually look at. And the first stream surfaces were hand-drawn, as with most data visualization concepts. The first is usually hand-drawn. So this is, these are hand-drawn stream surfaces showing rotational behavior and two vortices. And what they do, you can see here, primary separation and secondary separation. One of the properties of streamlines is they're always tangent to the flow, and therefore, flow cannot cross a streamline by definition, because they're always tangent to the flow. So you can't have flow like going from one side of a streamline to the other. And you can't have streamlines intersecting, like uh, crossing each other. Another way of saying that is that streamlines divide the flow into different regions of behavior or partition the flow on two sides. Or separate the flow is another word for that. If we ex extend that same idea to surfaces, we can say that surfaces, stream surfaces, separate the flow into different regions of be similar behavior. And that's what's been written down here. Primary separation and secondary separation. So whoever drew this was trying to show the separation of flow into different regions of similar behavior. And they did so in this illustration. So this is the primary separation, so the difference between vortical flow and non-vortical flow, and another one here. So it, stream surfaces are, are nice in that they divide the flow into different regions of similar behavior. That's one of the properties that they have, uh, which is advantageous. So. Some of the advantages are they separate steady state flow, so flow cannot cross a stream surface. Therefore, they separate the flow. That's not true about path surfaces and streak surfaces, by the way. It's only true about stream surfaces. Here are some more stream surfaces, and you can see different regions of flow behavior based on these surfaces. They facilitate or they enhance perception because we can add shading to them. And they're, they're more visually coherent than streamlines. So there's less visual clutter and complexity than lots of streamlines or curves. 
They have well-defined normal vectors, right? Surfaces are usually composed of triangles, or often they're composed of triangles. Therefore, they have well-defined normal vectors, and therefore shading is, is easy. And surfaces also provide more rendering options. That means you can do other things with them, like add textures. You can apply texture mapping to surfaces and then play with the textures, as we saw in that little video before we jumped in here. But they do have some disadvantages. And that is the construction slash implementation. So they're non-trivial to implement in software. This is the, probably the major disadvantage of stream surfaces. This is why they're not that popular. They can result in occlusion. So if one surface hides another, there could be a surface behind here that we don't see. And then placement is still one of the challenges. How do you put them, position them in 3D space in a way that makes sense? <clears throat> Here are some stream surfaces that are composed of triangles. So the first stream surface implementations were composed of triangles. You can imagine a seating curve here and then integrating streamlines along the flow and the flow often diverges. So when the flow diverges, you have to insert new streamlines so the gap between them doesn't get too great. And then you have to introduce a triangulation between the streamlines. And this is what these slides are showing, the triangulation between streamlines as the flow diverges and converges. <coughs> and it's very complicated. That's what this, this it, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to keep track of what's going on there. So we tried an experiment that replaces the, the standard triangulation or the standard stream surfaces based on triangles with quads instead to see if we could simplify the construction of stream surfaces. So instead of trying to come up with a triangulation algorithm between streamlines, stream surfaces composed of streamlines, we tried to come up with a streamline constru stream surface construction algorithm that is based on quadrilaterals between the streamlines. So this is a stream surface, and if you look carefully, there's the underlying mesh there. And it's not a set of triangles, it's a set of quads, so polygons with four sides as opposed to three sides. So the standard is three sides. And the idea was actually a little bit inspired by marching cubes, because one of the great properties of the marching cubes algorithm is that it operates on a local cube-by-cube -cube basis. And we wanted to see if we could mimic that behavior with the stream surfaces operating on a quad-by-quad -quad basis as opposed to a whole surface, a whole surface uh, data structure. And we also have elements, the construction elements that, that overlap with the evenly spaced streamlines algorithm. So we tried to borrow properties of marching cubes in some ways and the evenly spaced streamlines algorithm to come up with a stream surface, a simpler stream surface construction algorithm than previous ones. So we have these three important algorithm properties. One's called D-sample, one's called D-advance, and one call, one's called D-sep. This D-sep is the exact same D-sep as from earlier today. The new, D, the new distances are the distance between data samples in the vector field and the distance between streamline points along the streamlines. 
And this is an overview of the algorithm. And those are the different stages. So it starts with the user placing a seeding curve in the flow. This is a manual seeding process. So the user is actually using some input device like a mouse to set the position of a seeding curve. So it's not about placement, it's just about construction. Placement algorithms are a separate lecture, but I don't think we're going to get that far. Once the curve is seeded by the user, there's something called the advanced front stage, which means all the streamlines from the curve are integrated one unit forward, one streamline step forward. So the next position on all the streamlines emanating from the seeding curve is computed using the same techniques as last week, one week ago. That's called advancing the front. Once the front is advanced, there are three cases that we look for. We look for flow divergence, which is when two streamlines are pointing away from each other or they're flowing away from each other. We look for convergence, which is when two streamlines are coming together. And we also test for something called shear, which is when both streamlines curve in the same direction. So we're looking for these three properties, divergence, convergence, and shear. I haven't said what we're going to do about those, but we look for those, those properties between streamlines. We test for them. Then we also test for terminating conditions. For example, does the stream service leave the domain? Does it collide with something? Does it self-intersect and so on? If the, if the stream surface is not terminated, then we repeat this loop over and over again. We advance the front and update the sampling. That those are the two basic operations. Advance the front, which means integrate streamlines, and then update the sampling. And it's the update the sampling that's the tricky part. Everything hinges around this update the sampling, which means handle divergence, convergence, and rotation. So we're entering this loop. If we, we exit the boundary or we hit the boundary, we terminate, stop advancement, and then add optional enhancements like shading and texture mapping, and render the surface. So it looks like a fancy diagram, but it's not that complicated, actually. It's pretty simple. The complexity is right here in this box. That's the, that's the complicated part. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about each one of these steps now in more detail. And if I lose anybody, please feel free to interrupt or ask questions. So the seeding, that's a stream surface seeding curve there, right here. It has a position in, in space, in 3D space. It has an orientation, so you can turn it around and rotate it in any arbitrary way. It has a length. And it has, uh, it, it has streamlines emanating from it in this case. This is a stream surface the mesh of the surface. And those streamlines have a separating distance. And in this case, it's one half of the D sample, which is the space between data samples and the original data set. So for every data sample in the original data set, there are two streamlines. And that's guided by something called the Nyquist limit or the Nyquist rate. And then after we have the seed, we take each streamline point along the curve and we integrate to find the next streamline point along each streamline. 
in accordance with last week's lecture. So I think everybody knows about that, yeah? So how do we handle divergence? This is the case when we advance the front, but the streamlines start to separate. If you, if you start to separate, then the surface is no longer smooth, right? If we have to add a rectangle to connect the two streamlines, then it's going to show up like this flat surface, stream surface, unless we update the sampling rate. In other words, we get aliasing artifacts that will show up as aliasing artifacts if we try to render a surface with big triangles or big rectangles. Right? Flat polygons don't occur in nature. So divergence leads to undersampling, or that's all, another way of saying that is aliasing. And that's shown in here. So this is, this is a streamline. This is a streamline as well. This is the initial streamline point, and that's the next streamline point along that streamline. This is an initial streamline point along streamline SNI plus 1. And this is the next one, SNI plus 1, I plus 1. And the streamlines are pointing away. How do we detect the divergent case? We have a test. We test the interior angles of the quad, alpha and beta. So if alpha is greater than 90 degrees, right, greater than a right angle, is we can see that this is greater than 90 degrees. Hopefully everybody can see that. And beta is greater than 90 degrees. If those two are true, and dsep is greater than dsample, this is dsep, by the way. If that, if that distance exceeds the distance between data samples, the original data samples, then we detect divergent flow and undersampling condition and we introduce new vertices into the service or a new streamline. In other words, we split the quad in two and that's here. So we start with this original configuration. All three of these tests turn out to be true and then we say divide the quad, divide and conquer. So we introduce a new seed point, a new streamlined seeding point, and we integrate the flow from there. And this quad, this what used to be a unit quad, is divided into two quads. So the surface is no longer one big quad. It's now two smaller quads. And that's how we handle divergence. And when we advance the front, then, we have three points to advance from instead of two. That's the idea. And suddenly this deseparation, the separation between streamlines is now one-half desep when we insert the new one. Does that make sense, hopefully, to everybody? I, I think it's intuitive but I can't be sure because I'm not sitting in the audience. <clears throat> the case of, this is, by the way, this is the most common case, divergent flow by far. Convergence is when streamlines come together, maybe they collide or they start to overlap. And this results in oversampling. If you get if you get streamlines that come too close together, and the, pol and the polygons that connect them become too thin, that can also show up as a strange artifact in your surfaces. It can throw off the shading because the the normals of the surface go wild. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that before. <clears throat> So it's a very, very similar test. So if you can understand this one, 
then you can understand everything. It's a set of tests that look at the interior angles of the quads and the distances that separate their vertices. It's always the same. We're looking at the interior angles of the quads and the di distances that separate the vertices along the uh, orthogonal to the streamlines, basically. So in this case, alpha is less than 90 degrees. So that's alpha, and you can see it's less than 90 degrees. Beta is less than 90 degrees. And then the edge length is less than one half. So that's this edge length, the DCEP. One half, the, edge, the DCEP is less than one half D sample. So that's a DCEP and that's a DCEP. And if all three of these tests turn out to be true, then we merge the two quads into one. So it's just the inverse of divergence. It's convergence. It's just the opposite, basically. And instead of introducing a new streamline with two new vertices, streamline vertices, we remove the streamline, or we terminate it. Another way to say that is to terminate. So we terminate this streamline and then remove this edge and it looks like this. So the old decepts are here, and then the new decept is here, and here are the streamlines. So streamline SI plus one gets terminated. Yep, that's convergence. For shear flow or curvature, this is what we're looking at. Here are some streamlines, and here's the advancing front. And if it curves, we can get these very, very uh, irregular quads. And the, this is the ideal quad with all interior angles at 90 degrees. Of course, that's not possible to always have that. But if the angles become too, too different from 90 degrees, they, they, the shading of the surface is, starts to flaw, starts to become flawed, because again, the, y, the normals of the surface start to vary too much. So we perform a test, surprise, surprise, or two tests. In this case, we test if alpha is less than 90 degrees, and beta is greater than 90 degrees. So that's a shear uh, case. So both, both moving this way. This is a right shear, by the way, or a right rotation. In this case, what we do is we reintegrate the second streamline, the one on the inside curve, at, at, a, to a, at a smaller distance. So we reintegrate at a smaller distance and the, the coefficient is alpha divided by 90 of the original. So it's a, a coefficient of the angle at which it turns. So we, we shorten the length of that quad by reintegrating this streamline a shorter distance. So that dt was the distance that we integrated the streamline in from last week. This time we multiply dt by alpha over 90, which makes it shorter. Now that is flow curving that way. We also look for flow curving the other way, but it's not useful to have another slide just when it's it's symmetric. So we just look for that. You can imagine the other way, right? Just modify, swap A and B, alpha and beta, and then you get the other way. <clears throat> when do we stop? So we stop. It's possible that the surface hits a boundary or an object 
and then it has to terminate and move around the boundary. This is a stream surface and it hits a, a square block and it terminates here and then continues on around the block. By the way, those are the quads, so you can see the quads. And every line moving this way, a line with the flow, is, is a streamline. And once we do that, these two portions of the stream surface are computed independently of one another. So they split and they're computed independent. Now this streamline hit, or these streamlines hit a critical point, which is zero velocity. Or that's the same thing as saying, in this case, it's hit an object causing zero velocity. Exiting the domain, or the boundaries of the simulation. And the other is a possible predetermined maximum length. The length of a surface is usually called geodesic length. You don't, we don't use that term very much. I don't know why we don't use that term more often, but the length of a flight is a geodesic length because the, the Earth is curved. You don't fly in a straight line. You fly in a curve. So unfortunately, we never say, like, the geodesic length of the flight is... is 5,000 kilometers. I don't know why, but that would be a good thing to, to say, actually, rather than, like, just the length is this, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> I, actually, sometimes you hear the phrase, like, the length that the crow flies, or something like that. The path that the crow flies. <laughs> And with the basic algorithm in place to construct the services, services, surfaces, we can add enhancements, like the stream surface painter, and that's what lets the user control the length of the stream surface interactively with a slider. And that helps with occlusion, understanding different parts of the surface that occlude one another. We could also join the streamlines in the orthogonal direction to the flow and form timelines and time ribbons. But in order to do that, we have to turn off shear. So all the streamlines are um, moving at the, the same rate, advecting at the same rate. And that's what timelines look like by the way. Timelines are lines that are formed when we drop a number of particles into the flow all at the same time, but at different positions, and we connect them with a curve. So you can imagine in that, in that analogy I used earlier today, looking at a river, looking down at a river, instead of dropping just one chestnut, at one time or several chestnuts at one location. It's say 10 chestnuts all lined up together with five people, one like, all dropping the chestnuts at exactly the same time. They splash into the water and then you connect them up with a curve. So they have this special property that they've all been dropped into the flow at the same time, which is why it's called a timeline, but at different positions. We, because we have surfaces and quad-based surfaces, it's easy to texture map them. So it's easy to apply a texture to every quad with an arrow, for example, that shows the downstream direction. And they also, it, this also has the property that the stream lines that construct, that compose the stream surface are approximately evenly spaced. It, it, that, that same property shows up because we've used that same parameter DSEP to separate the streamlines in the first place. Okay, so that's that 
bit now. Let's watch the demo again. So we saw the demo. Now you'll see it again, and it will make perfect sense. So these are the stream surfaces in action. So that's the stream surface construction, and that's the user setting the length, the geodesic length. You can give the user interactive control of the geodesic length, and we call that a stream surface painter. <clears throat> this is a stream surface from the Hurricane Isabel simulation. So it's a big stream surface, and then we, sh we, we zoom in, if I can pause it, and we can look at the quads that, that it's composed of. And then the, the, the stream surface has been color mapped based on the properties of each quad. So all the divergent quads are in blue. All the convergent ones are in red. Then we have left rotation and right rotation and something called laminar flow, which just means it's not diverging, not converging, and it's not rotating. So that's what it looks like when you color map the, the quads. <clears throat> I don't think I see any convergence there, actually. So this is adding texture maps to the to the stream surfaces and it's easy because you can texture map a quad very easily. Like textures are usually quadrilaterals in the first place. And then just by swapping the textures we get these different characteristics. So you can you can set the transparency of a texture. You can perforate an arrow in a texture. You can make the textures completely transparent, or you can make just the arrows transparent, or just the perforations transparent. It's all just switching the textures. And you can animate the textures, so OpenGL makes animating the textures, or so translating them very easy. And those stream, those arrows, they look, they, they have the illusion that they look like they're moving up the, up the downstream, but actually they're not, they're not continuously moving downstream. It's just an illusion. It's just a, a, a rotating texture in every single quad. And sometimes you can see the transitions between quads. That's another stream surface on the Hurricane Isabel simulation again. And that's showing the stream lines that the stream surface is generated from. And this is another property. So that's that's the that's the mesh that's forming the stream surface and then we turn off the rotation aspect and we can emulate or construct timelines and then we can animate the timelines as they move downstream to study the properties of the flow and because we have quads we can now uh, introduce time ribbons so same thing as timelines, but they have a fixed width in the downstream direction. So they're just like stream ribbons, but they're orthogonal to stream ribbons. And that can help us look at the properties of the flow as well. If we, we can apply the same algorithm to unsteady flow, but now the surface can intersect itself. So path lines and path surfaces can intersect themselves. And that's why that path surface was shown semi-transparent. 
so you can see through it. Any questions about stream surface construction? Does it look like a good test question? That one? Good. Okay, we will stop there for today.